Ooh, what a day. I have, uh, I've been working all morning and then I just got home and then I spent four hours painting, <laughs> trying to get those, the, the closet doors finished on my house because it's taken forever for the crew to get everything done. So my wife was painting the closet doors when I got home and then she had to go somewhere. So I spent the last four hours painting those doggone doors. Can't believe how long it takes, it takes to paint doors. Anyway, I wanted to come in and take a look at this video with you guys because, you know, I've made some comments in the recent videos about Ansel Keys that I was being kind of light on him, according to a lot of you. So I thought, you know what? Let's take a closer look at Ansel Keys. And there is one researcher I found in the carnivore world that I feel like I can truly trust her investigative reporting on this, and that's Nina Teekles. Some of you may have heard of her. I found her on Low Carb Down Under originally. And the channel we're going to be taking a look at today is Carnivore Clips. So, uh, and it's called How Saturated Fat Got the Blame. Nina Teekles guides us through history. So let's take a look at this video by Carnivore Clips. I want to tell you a story, uh, the story I tell in my book, in a very abbreviated way, of just how do we come to believe what we believe about fat and saturated fat and cholesterol. So it all starts in the 1950s. Um, you can see that chart that's uh, on your uh, right. That is the rising tide, the sharply rising tide of heart disease in America, which was terrifying. Uh, President Eisenhower himself has a heart attack in 1955, is out of the Oval Office for 10 days. That is a huge uh, and terrifying event for everybody. And just imagine, you know, men are dying in the prime of their life, right and left, and this had not happened to their fathers. This was something entirely new. And it was really important that people try to understand why is this happening. Well, there were a number of uh, ideas about it. Maybe it was vitamin deficiency, maybe it was auto exhaust, maybe it was that famous type A personality, you know, you yell all the time and then you just keel over with a heart attack. Um, these were all viable hypotheses. But there was one hypothesis proposed by this man, Ansel Keys, a pathologist at the University of Minnesota, and what he came up with with what was called his diet heart hypothesis. And his idea was that you would eat saturated fat and cholesterol in your diet, so it's meat, cheese, dairy, uh, and you would. This would lead to your having uh, elevated cholesterol in your blood, serum cholesterol. This would clog your arteries like uh, cold oil, hot oil down a cold stovepipe, and would give you a heart attack. That was his hypothesis. Um, and it turns out that he was just a very kind of outsized personality. He was very aggressive. I mean, he was called arrogant and a bully, even by his friends. And he could was said that he could argue anyone to the death. He was fiercely a believer in his hypothesis. And he was able to get himself into the, to the uh, Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association, which you see here. That was, at the time, the, really the only public health group that was dealing with heart disease, uh, and, and, and everybody was following their advice. In 1960, they came up with a paper saying, we really would like to tell the American public what to do to avoid heart disease, but there's no data. Uh, Ansel Keys gets on the Nutrition Committee, and one year later, with no greater data in hand, he's able to get this recommendation published, which says you need to restrict your saturated fat and cholesterol in order to prevent heart disease. And this is the first advice anywhere in the world telling people to cut back on saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, this is what I sort of think of like the little acorn that grew into the giant oak tree of advice that we have today. This is where this idea first became institutionalized. Um, so this meant in practice that you cut out uh, animal foods. Um, and I mean, sort of the easiest thing to imagine here is replacing butter with margarine. You replaced it with, you replaced your saturated fats with unsaturated fats, right? So instead of butter, which is saturated, you have margarine, which comes from polyunsaturated vegetable oils. And I think it's harder to imagine what you, how you have vegetable oils instead of meat for dinner, but that was the idea. 
Um, and we just have to go back in history for a second to remember what were the original fats that people cooked with. I mean, vegetable oils came later before people cooked with tallow, which comes from beef, and suet, which comes from um, sheep. And they mainly, the two main fats that, that European... The thing I understood about vegetable oils is that they, <clears throat> for the most part, started off as industrial lubricants because farmers didn't know what to do with the leftover cotton seed and things like that or whatever seed they had that wasn't growing or germinating. And uh, they would crush it and the oil would come out and they would use that in hydraulics and things like that. Now, I'm not an expert on that. I just know that they were using it in industrial uses and that when, uh, when they first looked at cottonseed oil, after it had been extruded from the seed like that, that it came into th this gelatinous form that if it was cleaned up, you know, bleached uh, clear white so that it looked nice and pretty, that it looked just like lard. So they decided to basically market it as lard. And uh, I'm not sure when the vegetable oils came into play. But with the exception of olive oil, it's one of the older ones I know that's been used out there. And there's a handful of other oils. But a lot of the oils we use today haven't been accessed and used the way they are now. Populations used and Americans used before 1900s was lard and butter. Lard is from pigs, obviously. And butter, um, and oils did not come onto the scene. They were they were actually the first oil that was sort of used was um, whale oil that was used to it was used to fuel the industrial revolution. Who what was going to keep all those machines lubricated? They used whale oil. When they killed off all the whales, they started to use cottonseed oil. Uh, and then in the early 1900s, somebody looked at cottonseed oil and figured out a way to harden it and said, hmm, that looks a lot like lard. <laughs> Why don't we try to sell that to Americans to eat? And that was... Next time I'll just wait and let her finish. <laughs> Frisco. And that came into the American food supply in 1911. And sure, and after that came ve regular vegetable oils. But these are new foods that used to be used to lubricate machinery, and still are. Um, but in any case, Ansel Keys really won the day. I mean, the way to understand him is that it was a moment of complete panic in the United States. There was a demand for some kind of answer. He walked into this vacuum with a very strong idea, and uh, his idea became adopted by the American Heart, Heart Association. And he was easily the most influential, he still is the most influential nutrition scientist in the history of nutrition science. So and here he is on the cover of Time Magazine in 1961, the same year of that American Heart Association recommendation. But what was the evidence at the time? Well, it really amounted to one study that he uh, himself had did called the Seven Country Study. Um, and it was funded by NIH in part. Um, I'm just going to... So this is what it was. It was a, a survey of nearly 13,000 men and women in seven countries around the world, mainly in Europe, but also in the US and Japan. And he looked at, Ansel Keys and his team went around and they looked at serum cholesterol levels and they looked at diet. And you know, Ansel Keys had gone into this study thinking, I want to prove my hypothesis. And he did, in the end, uh, show a very weak correlation between saturated animal fats and your risk of having a heart attack. Um, and if you read, if you are unfortunate enough to read uh, 10,000 nutrition studies as I have done, I would say 90% of them telescope back to Ansel Keys's seven country study. It is the, one of the most cited works ever. And, it was, and it's because it was really the only study of its day and because it launched 1,000 ships. And he, so I took, I spent an enormous, inordinate amount of time looking into the details of this study. I'm just going to give you a couple highlights of its methodological weaknesses. For one, it only measured the diets of fewer than 3% of its participants, which is nowhere near a statistically representative sample. So it really didn't know what these people were eating. Um, number two, it was, um, it was, 
a, 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 a kind, the kind of study that only shows association and not causation. So it really can't ever prove that reducing animal fats was what caused the reduction in heart attacks. Number three, it didn't actually show that, that there was a reduced total mortality. So people weren't dying of heart attacks, and maybe they were dying of something else. Anyway, I want to share with you one particular other methodological flaw, which I think is really more emblematic than anything else, which is that it had to do with the islanders of Crete. So these are the people on whom the whole Mediterranean diet came to be based. Ansel Keys looked at the dietary records of about 32 or 33 of them. That's the total population he looked at. He went to this island. He fell in love with them because they were just these, seemed to him ideal. They were, they had, they lived this life of a peasant. It was a beautiful, unruined Crete, not the hyper hoteled Crete of today. And, um, but it turns out, if you read the fine print of his study, that he went to Crete uh, three times for a week each. And one of those weeks he showed up, turns out he turned, he turned up during Lent uh, when everybody, <laughs> is avoiding eating animal foods. <laughs> so he no doubt. Well, that sure was convenient. If you're trying to say that they don't eat a lot of meat, let's see what this comes up to. Greek, or Greek Orthodox, uh, the Greek Orthodox fast is a strict one and means abstaining from all foods of animal origin, including fish, cheese, eggs, and butter. Undercounted the um, amount of saturated fats that was being consumed by that population. But as I said, ultimately, the ultimate problem was it was an epidemiological study. It showed association. It could not prove cause and effect. And for those of you who don't really understand what that means, I'm going to give you one quick example about epidemiology. Epidemiology. Well, I'm glad she said that because I wasn't sure what she meant. I kind of understood it, but at the same time, I kind of didn't. So looks at things that are correlated. Many things are correlated. So here we find that the divorce rate in Maine is correlated with your consumption of margarine. So does that mean you should reduce your consumption of margarine to prevent getting divorced? <laughs> no. <Good point. laughs> That's what's called a false association. There are many things that are associated with each other, but they do not cause each other. Here's another example. People with yellow fingers tend to die more of lung cancer. We shouldn't avoid yellow fingers at all costs. What causes yellow fingers? Smoking. <laughs> so you may be missing the thing altogether. Um, and I want to say that nutrition scientists in the 1960s, they knew that that the seven country study was a weak study and that they needed to do random, what's the, a, a, a more rigorous form of science called randomized controlled clinical trials. And they did them. Governments around the world undertook for billions of dollars in randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, and these took place, many, of the, I'm saying Australia and England, and most were in the US, um, but in Finland, in Denmark, uh, sorry, Norway. Um, and many of them took place in uh, mental institutions or hospitals where people were confined. And uh, these are the kind of experiments you cannot do now because they're considered unethical. But the reason that they're such good trials is that you control all the food of everybody in that setting. People are not allowed to go out down to the local bodega. They, you know, you can see what people are eating. And this is different than the many of the clinical trials that you read about today when somebody, they're really just given a diet book and maybe they're given an hour of counseling, you know, once a week and they're given a support group, but you really don't know what they're eating. So these were well-controlled trials. There were on tens of thousands of people. I mean, this is a very conservative number I've put up there, uh, the 25,000. It's just, but, but if, you, if you, depending on how you count, you can get up to 50, 60,000 people were tested in experiments lasting one to 12 years. Um, and what were the results? There has no effect of saturated fats on cardiovascular mortality or total mortality. And this is uh, my summary of it, but I can, um, I'm, uh, there's, you know, a Cochrane review on this with the same results, just no effect. Um, so, you know, when I hear that about there being no effect of saturated fats, my initial response is, well, anybody's study can kind of say anything they want, as we can see with Ansel Keys, that his studies can be slanted the way they want them to slant. But the one thing I can say is, in my situation, 
I went from 275, 285 pounds down to 189. Actually, I got down to 176 at one point, but I'm 189 right now, which is my high school wrestling weight. I'm 50 years old. I feel better than I have my entire life. And I don't have any uh, high blood pressure anymore, something I had before I started doing Lion Diet, which is a sure sign of something going wrong in your cardiovascular health. So my cardiovascular health looks better than it did before. And I've been eating meat steadily for almost two and a half years now. So when, when I combine that knowledge and experience with those test results, I can't help but say that, yeah, this confirms exactly what she just said. Because I'm in the best health I've been in just eating meat. Something we've been told for 40 plus years not to eat too much of. And that's all I eat. Specifically red meat. So, yeah. You know, it's, it's also the case that a lot of other people are having these results. And when you get enough anecdotal results, it's no longer anecdotal. You've, you've got a test group. Ansel Keys' hypothesis is actually the most tested hypothesis in the history of nutrition and heart disease. And we can fairly say that the results were null, which is they did not show him to be correct. Oh, that's it. Okay, well, there you go. That's a short one on Ansel Keys. Um, I'm going to take a look into, into a few more and see what else we can find out about because I've, I've heard people say certain things about what Ansel Keys was doing and how he was bought off or on the take or in the pocket of the vegetable oil companies. Here I mostly see that he, he had an idea in his head and he decided that that was going to be it. And because his lifetime of research depended upon it, he had to prove his result. And like what happens with a lot of people, if you go out seeking to prove a certain result, you're usually going to get lucky and actually prove what you want to prove because you're going to ignore the truth that you find and you're going to accept whatever you see that supports what you're going to say. That seems like that's exactly what he did. Uh, simply by going to Crete during Lent uh, is going to skew the numbers because it's going to make it look like, well, they don't eat a whole lot of meat if you're looking at their diet at the time when you get there. And that's what I understood that he did. At least that's what I had heard from somebody else. So her pointing that out show, goes to show that he either was very sloppy in his study or he intentionally did things that were meant to skew it. Getting to understand who Ansel Keys was and what he said seems to be a real key for us understanding how we got where we are now in the nutrition realm because everything seems to hinge on his hypothesis. And if his hypothesis has been tested repeatedly and proven wrong repeatedly, and even the AHA has backed away from some of those claims, why are we still talking about this? <laughs> uh, other than the fact that there's just a lot of bad information out there. And the only thing we can do is keep speaking the truth and keep searching for truth. Searching for what the truth is, not for what we want the truth to be. What actually happened? What was said? What are the facts? Well, this is just the first of many on Ansel Keys. I'll see what else I can bring to you guys. Meanwhile, if you wouldn't mind, stick around for a quick message from a, a company that I found recently. Actually, it was a viewer who, who contacted me, and he has a company that makes magnesium lotion. And he sent me a couple of his containers of magnesium lotion, and I thought I'd give them a try. Now, I truly believe the best way to get magnesium is by consuming it. But at the same time, I've seen some benefits from topical magnesium in the past, so I thought I'd give his a try. And so far, I've found it to be not counterproductive, that's for sure. And when my wife's done rubbing my legs for a short while with those, they tend to feel good through the night. So I just want to show you what he makes and see if it's something you'd be interested in. I'll have a link in the description for you to go to, and you can check out this topical magnesium lotion. I'll see you next time.
we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat?